Welcome to the Therapist on Fire podcast. My name is Dr. Emma Shapiro, and I'm here with Tracy Davis, a pediatric occupational therapist and founder of Global Therapy Consultants. Welcome, Tracy. Uh, thank you. I'm so excited to have you here. And first, why don't you just share what is Global Therapy Consultants and what do you guys do? So we are um, a small business that works with um, children all over the world. We have a telehealth component where we're working um, with children who are overseas and um, we do uh, trainings for schools. We do trainings for other therapists, um, I guess lecture. And then we also have a consulting branch of our um, business where I actually help other practices and other therapists set up telehealth programs for their own business. That's amazing. How did you get inspired to start Global Therapy Consultants? Sort of share your story. Well, it came from a need. Uh, my family, um, I got into telehealth about six years ago, um, which was kind of um, a little bit on the forefront for telehealth for occupational therapy. Um, and I did it because um, my family was moving every couple years. I never had trouble finding work. That wasn't the issue. But the issue was I had to start a new job every time we moved. We're moving every two years, something like this. And it was just a lot to start over every time. Um, and so I read some research about the efficacy of telehealth. And so I started doing it. And then um, I was inspired to start my own business because when we were living overseas, um, I was approached by a lot of families who were in similar situations as we were, that they were moving a lot, and when they would move to a, a new country, then the services weren't always consistent, and they needed a way to keep consistency with their children. Um, so I started um, my own um, company then, um, helping them keep the same therapist, even if they had to move, which was just a huge um, thing for these families whose kids needed help and they needed that consistency. I think that's a great idea. You're exactly right that these services aren't just for the United States. They're all over the world and all yeah. over in different countries. Um, yeah. what, were, what were some of the biggest barriers you found to trying to connect uh, these clients to therapists in different areas? I think there's still, even now, there's still just a lot of, especially with OT and PT, there's um, a lot of misconception or um, even just not a great um, uh, concept of how telehealth can work. And so I needed to provide a lot of education to not only families, but um, physicians and even, you know, sometimes some of the other therapists who were working with these kids because we never ever had a goal of taking that place. There's always a place for in-person services. But um, working together with, with other um, providers and um, just filling that niche. So I needed to do a lot of education. That was a huge barrier, um, number one. Um, the second one is just making sure that, um, that we are following all of the licensure requirements. <laughs> that's a huge, in the, in the um, I teach a continuing ed course on telehealth, and that's the number one question I get just about licensure. Um, so we need to, so that takes a lot of, of work to um, kind of stay up to date on all of that. And um, reimbursement is always the other question as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, my model is, is just a fee-for-service model. Um, you know, I provide the super bill to the families. But, um, but that, sort of, that sort of issue, I needed to figure out how I was going to overcome that as well. Are you cash-based or are you using insurances? Yeah, I'm cash-based. Um, and I, I just, um, as a courtesy, provide a super bill to families so they can um, submit to insurance for reimbursement if they want. Um, and it's been hit or miss as far as that goes. Um, it just depends on the insurance company. Okay. But, um, but I'm feeling this niche, this, this need is so great that um, I haven't really um, experienced any downside to, to being a cash-based practice. Well, I think I think that it's great that you sort of have the best of both worlds. You can appeal mm -hmm. to these patients and to your clients by having it be simple, easy access. But on your end, cash-based makes it a lot easier for you. But mm -hmm. they have the opportunity to still 
potentially get reimbursed for insurance. So people thinking about yeah. doing cash-based practices or teletherapy practices, think about um, what Tracy's doing and allow for them, it take the burden off of your shoulders, put it on theirs, but it still yes. allows your patients to have that option and give them a little bit more peace of mind when they see a, uh, maybe a more expensive fee for service. Yeah, absolutely. But once once clients see the the benefits and the the progress that is made with their children and you know just the um the need that we're able to fill um i don't none of them ever see the the um the money that they pay as an issue really if you know once if they're able to cover that cost and we always work with families if there's truly a financial burden we will always work out something with them because my goal is more that um, people have access to services. Definitely. Well, I think that's a great thing about teletherapy is that you can get this in rural communities, in communities mm -hmm. where you are really underserved by the medical profession. Yeah. Everyone, no matter how much you make, pretty much has a computer or they have a mobile phone. So you can pretty much exactly. go there. Um, exactly. Can you describe how you... So uh, is your business model that you find therapists and then you sort of teach them how to run this telepractice for the client that you've, that you're going to be forwarding them? Is that yes. Right? Yes. That's, that's kind of the business model that I follow. Um, I, it's, you know, I usually like to find therapists who are passionate about, you know, working with children because the, because telehealth is really, it's identified as a service delivery model. It's not a specialty. And so I feel that teaching someone, um, an independent therapist, someone who, you know, is, is kind of independent, um, teaching someone to take their skills and use them in a virtual way is not the hard part. So, um, so I work with the therapist to get them kind of up to speed on, on telehealth. And then um, I keep, a, you know, just a bank of a few therapists and contact them when I have a need. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So if anyone would like to be a pediatric <laughs> OT or work with Tracy here, just a little shout out. Don't worry, she yeah. doesn't me do this, but <laughs> it just seems wonderful. And, you know, anyone thinking about going into teletherapy, it's great to talk to a mentor and talk to someone who has those skills and has already set up sort of this streamlined um, model that you can just easily implement. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your favorite things about being like a teletherapy or teleoccupational therapist? Um, without a doubt, the flexibility. Um, I love, I live in a rural area myself currently, and I love being able to access my work and continue to be a professional um, without being, you know, having to travel a long distance for a job. Um, I love too that it's, um, for me, this is an entrepreneurial model, but even before I owned my own business and I was doing telehealth work as a contractor, it was still, I still had control over my schedule because I was contracting, you know, with, with another company. So I love having that control, making my own schedule. Um, and then I love um, also just working with um, families who maybe hadn't had access to services um, before. Um, just because it makes such a difference to us. It's not, it's, it's just our job, but to a family, it can just mean all the difference in the world. Um, you know, some of the consulting work I do, um, I work with uh, places that do a lot of work in urban areas as well. Um, and, you know, places where they can't really keep a therapist feeling comfortable going to, um, you know, some of these urban environments that um, aren't, always super safe or things like that, then, um, you know, a lot of therapists don't really want to go into those environments. It's another perfect place for telehealth to, to thrive. No, I think that's a great, uh, you bring that, I'm going to remember that for the future when I don't like to go somewhere, I'm going to be like, telehealth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those were some of your positives. How about some of maybe the frustrations or the struggles to either running uh, a a, a session so just an mm -hmm. individual session or an entire business so for sessions there's definitely challenges I always say that technology is great until it doesn't work um, <laughs> when someone signs on and their audio doesn't work or um, something and then we have to spend a few minutes working out those technological glitches that's that's always um, frustrating um, and I, I know too that um, 
you know, some, there are still, especially here and and in some other areas of the world, there are still places that the, the internet access isn't the greatest, um, isn't the most consistent. So that can um, sometimes present some challenges, although we have a few options there. Um, so those are definite challenges. And then I think just getting over the mental barrier. Um, you know, I was a therapist for probably 15 years um, before I started doing telehealth. And I had this mental barrier. I didn't know how I was going to do all these hands-on things virtually so I had to I had to learn that and that was that was hard and now it's not a big deal at all but then it was a it was a very big deal and um, I mentor therapists and train therapists all the time who have those same kind of questions um, so so that part can get difficult um, and there's a huge problem-solving aspect to that um, as far as running a business you know it's just um, my business is fairly small and so it's pretty much me <laughs> So, um, so doing all those little things to keep on top of, to keep on top of everything, um, and walking that line between, you know, I tend to hire people who are very independent, um, who can, who can take what I give them and run with it. So, but walking that line between, um, letting them run with it and then, but still knowing what they're doing and, and, um, so that we don't ever get into a situation where I, I didn't know there was a problem. <laughs> um, you know, just staying on top of all that without, you know, micromanaging. But just all those little tasks is hard. All the little things like, you know, I do all the billing and I do all of the, you know, I do all the everything. So, so that part's hard. It requires me to be very, very organized. So. Yes. When I got into becoming an entrepreneur, I'm like, this is not as easy as it sounds. No. And my, you know, I keep a, I keep a, an online calendar, like a Google calendar, but then I also need a paper-based one because I can't, I just can't always have the digital version. I need to write things down and I use a highlighter color coding system for which tasks belong to which hat that I'm wearing. And it's just, it's, you know, even just making that to-do list every week is, is, uh, takes some time, but I also love it. It's worth it. Definitely. Anything you can call your own. I think yes. even if it's more difficult, it's sort of like that difficulty is worth it because it's yes. your difficulty, not your yes. difficulty. You're not doing anything for anyone else. It's all directly, um, you know, related to your, your efforts yeah. are related. You know, they come to fruition for you and for no one else. So Exactly. And really, I mean, the opportunities are limitless when you start your mm -hmm. own business the opportunities are limitless. You put the limits on yourself, but you could grow this as big or as small as you want to. You yes. can take it in whatever directions. I mean, it seemed like at, at first, I mean, look at you, you at first, you know, just thought you were going to just do occupational therapy and now you're consulting. Right. So you can yes. see that you can start a business with one idea and even that can transform into an even bigger, a more global idea. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so speaking of organization, what are some of your favorite uh, technologies that you use or, or, or tools that you really use to help run your business and your sessions? Um, so, I mean, I use, um, I use a Google calendar. I can't, you know, I cannot, and it's all color coded, you know, and the personal stuff is shared with the family and everything else, you know, um, I have to use that, of course. Um, for telehealth sessions, you know, there are a lot of different options out there, but um, currently I love Zoom, um, and there's another, there's, another, um, there's another company that I've been intrigued with lately. I've been talking with them. It's called Blue Jay Engage, and they, um, it's kind of a hybrid system um, that incorporates a lot of different features, and it's built just for therapists, so I'm kind of excited about, you know, that developing. Um, you know, honestly, though, I just use a lot of common things. I mean, for telehealth sessions, I still use, you know, for OT, I still use yoga and Play-Doh, and, but I love YouTube videos also and educational game websites and things like that. Um, but for the other thing that I really, really um, need on a daily basis is a good way to bill. Um, you know, when I first started out, I was kind of, and I work with families all over the world, so I can't just, you know, I can't just mail them a bill or I can't just email them a bill and they write me a check because it doesn't work that way in most of the rest of the world. 
Um, so I, you know, I'm currently using QuickBooks for billing and it's working really well for me. Um, um, but, you know, at some point I'm going to have to move to a more sophisticated um, EMR. So that I think that's, that's a big thing if you're running your own business is to have something that you're comfortable using. Definitely. Um, and I think you, you bring up a good point about scaling too. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, there's so much technology out there and there's smaller systems. You can use Google Docs, you can use Zoom, yes. you can use paper charts, you know, and you can scale uh, a teletherapy business up. So you can go yeah. simple like that. And as you get more clients and as it becomes more overwhelming and you see yourself spending too much time, that's when then you get uh, Blue Jay or um, yes. PT live or direct yes so direct, PT. Biting, direct PT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes and you know that brings up a good point I mean I I've bootstrapped my entire business so um you know that was important to me that I was able to cover my costs from day one um so I was using things like google docs um right at the beginning and just using PayPal or whatever, whatever I had available for the, for what I could afford. And I've kind of upgraded as I went along. Um, so, you know, I, that was important to me, but you know, you can always, you can always switch. And with technology, most technology these days, even if you switch from one to another, um, it, you know, there are features that you can transfer your information. You don't have to all do it by hand. So, um, so it's not a big deal to switch to something, you know, more high tech. Definitely. Once, oh, yes, once definitely. you can do that. There's lots of uploading features. I mean, technology has just gotten so advanced. Yeah. I mean, pretty much Google spreadsheets can almost integrate into a lot of different platforms and they understand yes. that people are using that. And even to one more point that I'm, as I'm listening to you is, you know, if you're starting a new business, you don't want to take out a debt, a lot of debt. You don't want to take out a lot of loans. So, you know, start yeah. small because you may not even like this business mm -hmm. like cash therapy may not be for you um yeah. becoming a tele ot may, may not be for you you may, it looks amazing it looks nice but then you get into it and you're like oh maybe not so you don't want to end up spending thousands upon thousands of dollars exactly only to potentially go back to your you know permanent position right exactly um, so I know that you do consulting and this is something I think a lot of people are going to want to get into is, is consulting for various things, social media, marketing, mm -hmm. um, podcasting, uh, blogging, et cetera. How do you find your, uh, consulting clients? Um, so, you know, honestly, I, um, I've just kind of built that also from the ground level up. Um, I, I consistently update my um, resume <laughs> so that I always have, you know, every time I've done some new thing, I put it on there. Um, and my LinkedIn page as well. Um, probably my biggest clients have found me through LinkedIn. Um, so I didn't even do a ton of advertising or anything like that. Um, but, but one thing I did was I stuck with what I knew. Um, so, you know, I, I really like telehealth for the access that it provides, but I didn't necessarily want to be treating full-time telehealth for the rest of my life or anything like that, but I knew it well. And so I started kind of putting on my, you know, all my social media and things like that, that I, that I provide consultations for telehealth. And um, I wrote and started teaching a continuing ed course and then people started finding me. Um, so that's kind of how, how I found my, my, my clients for consulting. Um, I didn't do a lot of, um, you know, mass messages or anything like that, but I stuck with what I knew and I started to systematically work to make it known that I have expertise in something that I, that I am an expert in, in some sort of niche that people need to know about. I think that that's great. You know, you don't want to be spamming people and having huge mm -hmm. ads and things like that. And, and really, you know, a lot of people are talking, there's a huge talk about like Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. But I think for things like this is you, you don't want to have just someone that's just perusing and just glancing. You want to have someone that's actually going to take action. Mm -hmm. And the best place to do that is in LinkedIn. LinkedIn is pretty yep. much, I think, the best professional platform mm -hmm. uh, to network and to connect and find jobs and consulting positions. Um, and 
then, you know, Facebook is great. Getting involved in the Facebook groups yes. and, and just answering questions, showing that you're involved, that you have knowledge. And that's what I've found a lot is that, you know, someone will message and be like, oh, you know, I really want to get into tele-OT. And then you could message and be like, oh yeah, like, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. And then that yes. builds into this professional relationship. And that's exactly what I did in a lot of instances is I just got involved and I just, you know, would make a comment or I would, you know, put something on my LinkedIn or link to some article or I, you know, something like that. And then, um, word just kind of got out that way. Great. Great. Well, and that's how I found you too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, what is your best advice for someone wanting to become a tele OT speech, uh, PT, et cetera. What's your best advice for someone wanting to go into this type of practice? Well, I think, um, you know, you kind of mentioned it a little bit and it was a perfect, it was a perfect segue into this, um, that, you know, you don't have to take a full-time leap into something like this. It's very easy. I have a lot of therapists who work for me. They literally see one to two clients and they have another job and, you know, but they maybe have Friday afternoons off or something like this. And so they see someone for me um, because they wanted to try something different and they wanted, you know, to experience it, but weren't quite ready to make that full-time leap. And telehealth is a really easy way to do that because a lot of telehealth positions are contractor-based positions. And so um, you don't necessarily have to take a 20-hour-a-week job um, doing it, things like that. Another thing that I say is if you have your own in-person business or you see your own clients, um, maybe in their homes or something like that, go through your current caseload and try to identify who might be a good um, person to do even just a hybrid model of telehealth with them. You know, maybe they come in four times once a week um, and you want to, you think they'd be a great candidate for telehealth. So maybe they come in twice a month to see you and then the other on the off weeks you meet with them via telehealth and just see how that works that way. So there's no reason why you have to just, it's an all or nothing thing. You can easily um, start slow like that. Totally. I'm just brainstorming here, but as I'm listening to you, you could even have like different packages. So it's like an in-person mm -hmm. consultation, you, you know, an evaluation mm -hmm. that needs to be more hands-on. You really need to yep. see and speak with the, the therapist. And yep. then that could be, and then you could have like, in addition, you get like three tele uh, sessions. And so that's yes. your practice. So you're getting more therapy and you're mm -hmm. giving them at a cheaper price point than if they were to see you in person every time, but potentially just getting the same amount of results. And it's almost saving you time and effort as well. Yeah, you can totally mix and match. And, you know, honestly, telehealth is so good for people who might have compromised immune systems so, or um, have difficulty traveling in the winter. If you live in a climate that's, you know, that has icy conditions in the winter. Um, so offering that option might be very, very... Um, you know, might just be very, um, I don't know, it might be a good idea um, to a lot of people who, you know, struggle to come see you during certain times of the year, or they might get sick a lot or, you know, something like that. No, that's a great idea. My grandma lives in Wisconsin. And so yeah. there's times where it's like, she is, she is literally stuck in her house. And exactly. I'm like, not walk outside, grandma, there is ice. And so yes, yes. And it could improve your attendance as well. If you're, ex yes. if you experience um, decreased attendance um, during winter months or something like that, then telehealth might be a good solution to that. I think that's a great idea. Boom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, what is like your best way for best advice for someone if they're trying to find clients so trying to find patients how do you go about that if you're not a big uh, business or big company yeah um i would still um talk with local um physicians offices i would still visit with them i would still you know give them your information um and just tell them that you offer this as a service as well um, maybe offer to do a couple from some free screenings within their office or things like that because they might have people that that they could help you identify that would be um, that would be a good candidate for telehealth 
um, no matter what field you're in, you know, it doesn't have to be pediatrics. Um, another, another place actually that physical therapy has grown quite a bit is um, both home health and orthopedics. Um, you know, someone might have had knee surgery or something and gone home. Um, you know, if there's not any other complicating factors, there's no reason why they couldn't do those visits via telehealth. So, um, so visiting the local physician's offices is still a good idea. Um, you could also, there are some companies that do that, um, some actual telehealth companies that that's all they do is telehealth. Um, so you could contact them and just, you know, um, express your interest. Um, a lot of them will let you come on with just, you know, a couple hours a week or something like that. So speaking of the big uh, telehealth companies, what's your thoughts on trying to do it yourself? And, and this is probably more for if you're wanting to just have like a little side hobby of, mm-hmm. of teletherapy. What's your thoughts on, you know, trying to do this yourself and just have one or two clients versus contracting with a bigger company? Yeah. So, I mean, there's really no reason why you can't. I mean, honestly, <laughs> Um, it's real, it's fairly inexpensive to get started if you want to do it yourself. Um, the, the biggest things you have to remember is just to be HIPAA, HIPAA compliant. So, you know, you can't necessarily just use FaceTime for visits or Skype or something. Although there are some companies out there that actually encrypt things like FaceTime and Skype. So you could use that, which is a great option for people, you know, maybe someone elderly who has limited technology knowledge but they know FaceTime because they talk to their grandkids or something. Um, so there are some companies that do encrypt and, and create that HIPAA compliance, but you just need to make sure you're HIPAA compliant in whatever you're doing. So, um, but honestly, there are so many options out there. I mean, I mentioned Zoom. It's a really easy one to use. Um, their HIPAA compliant version, um, you, can, you can use that for, oh gosh, I can't remember the price, but it's very, very inexpensive. I mean, you know, a couple of clients w- could cover that cost. So, um, you know, or even one client would cover that cost. So, you know, it's not hard to get started. You don't need a building. Um, you know, my office is in my home. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's very easy to do. And especially if you just want to start off slowly, like you said, you know, you don't necessarily want to compete with all the big names or anything like that, but you want a couple clients. Then visit a few physician's offices in town. Let them know you have this option. Give them your business card and set up a virtual therapy room. So offer to do, offer to do a little half-hour education session or offer to um, start a home exercise group where everyone can just log in and you lead, you lead a home exercise group, um, something like that, you know, just to get your name out there. Wow. Awesome tips. I'm loving this. Like that's a really, really great tips. Um, well, do you have any other big advice or any other big tips you want to share with the listeners? It can be anything at all. It doesn't have to be teletherapy or consulting related, just anything at all. Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, I, um, I love what I do, but I never saw myself as someone who is just going to be working at some, you know, clinic, doing the same thing for the rest of my life. And the thing is, my knowledge is just as valuable as my, um, my therapy skills. Um, so don't sell yourself short. Um, if you are a therapist who is kind of an entrepreneur, think about what kinds of, of knowledge that you have and how you can share it with others. Um, uh, because that's that's still a skill a skill that we is unique to us as therapists um something that you might know you might have great knowledge in um orthopedics or in hand therapy or in um you know exercise and wellness um so take what you know and think about how you can how how you can use that to grow to get your name out there. You know, it doesn't always have to be just a direct therapy practice, um, because a huge part of my business is that consultation, and I love helping other people get started. Um, so, but that's not necessarily conducting a therapy session. So there's just a lot that you can do as a therapist that isn't that isn't that traditional treatment. So. No, great advice. There are so many things and so many talents. You just have to look at your daily life, like almost just be introspective mm-hmm. and, and say, what am I doing? And what parts of my life do I like to do? And what do yeah. I want to do? And, and really, we are more than just therapists. You know, yes. we're excellent communicators. We are in. Insp- you know, we inspire people, we are motivators, we, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have our therapy tools, but there's so much out there, wellness, so, so 
you have all those tools. You just have to think about it and, and find your passion. And yes. it's extremely flexible, especially with technology. And like what Tracy said, it's, you can start really, really low cost. And just mm-hmm. if, if, you know, you want to do teletherapy or, or anything else. Well, th- um, Tracy, thank you so much for just sharing so much information and so much inspiration. Um, what are some of the links that people should go to to find you and to ask any questions? Well, I mean, you can come to my website, of course. It's globaltherapyconsultants.com. And um, actually, you can email me directly. It's Tracy with an EY at globaltherapyconsultants.com. So, and I'm I'm also on Facebook. My business is on Facebook. So you can do a search for that same business and find me there. Um, And I'm also on LinkedIn. so So you can search for me there as well. Um, I try to be really responsive. I get emails and phone calls all the time from people who are, you know, trying to start something new. So um, I try really hard to, to respond to everyone that contacts me because there's plenty of work to go around. And there, um, there are plenty of therapists who think that they don't have the tools to get started, but just need a little bit of push from someone else. So I'm awesome. happy to be that person. Awesome. Well, I think you're a perfect person to push people <laughs> in the right direction, Tracy. Thank you so much for being a truly a therapist on fire and for inspiring and helping so many people, um, whether it be patients or therapists. So I appreciate your time. And everyone, check out uh, Global Therapy Consultants if you have any interest in working with Tracy either as a potential therapist and mm-hmm. for her uh, clients or to start your own teletherapy practice. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you.